Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the second day of the Hindsight Is 2021 KU Art History Graduate Student Symposium. The theme for today's session is Retrospection and Response to History. This session's presentations explore engagement with and reaction to the past and to the canon. Tonight, we will hear about how an Italian fascist mural was altered to remove- Good evening, everyone. And later Welcome to re-add- to the second day. Apologize for that. I did not mute the other window. Tonight, we will hear how an Italian fascist mural was altered and later to remove and later to re-add fascist iconography. We will see how memory and patronage impact Buddhist iconography. We will consider how history and archives are made from a catalog of Southern Song paintings created during the Qing Dynasty to how Black women can work to create a non-exploitative archive of their work. Today's session will end with a panel style question and answer period with our graduate student presenters. While the presenters are speaking, we encourage you to type any questions you have in a chat for the live stream. Moderators from the KU Art History Department will ask questions on your behalf to the speakers. If the chat function is not currently working for you, as we had an issue last night, we encourage you to refresh the web page and that should fix the issue for you. I would like to take a moment to repeat our university's land acknowledgement. The University of Kansas acknowledges that we reside on the ancestral territory of several tribal nations, including the Ka, Osage, and Shawnee people. Specifically, the university occupies land taken from these nations. We further recognize that Native Americans are traditional guardians of the land and that there is an enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. The University of Kansas recognizes, advocates, and supports the sovereignty of the four federally recognized tribes of Kansas, the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas, the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas, and Nebraska and the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. As the symposium is taking place virtually and you are joining us from many locations across the nation and the world, the symposium planning committee would like to encourage you to take the time to learn more about the people who have traditionally called your region home. Now I'd like to welcome Ray Gao, a PhD candidate from the Crest Foundation Department of Art History who will introduce tonight's first speaker. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm Rain Gao, and I'm from the Department of Art History here at KU. And it is my pleasure to serve as one of the moderators for tonight's session. So our first presenter of this evening is Ashley Lindman. She is a PhD candidate in art history at Florida State University where she is writing her dissertation on 20th century Italian mural and their connections to modern imperialism. Her research interest includes global modern muralism, and she recently taught a graduate seminar on that topic, which examined WPM murals in the United States, Mexican muralism, Soviet Union photo murals, French popular front murals, Italian fascist murals, and more, Please join me in welcoming Ashley for her presentation tonight, Reconsidering Italian Fascist Murals, Signoris l'Italia tra le arti e le scienze for Spensiana University. Let's welcome, thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I also wanna say thank you to the um, Symposium Planning Committee for putting this all together. I think it's really, wonderful that we can get together um, virtually and share our research. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. Um, I also want to make a quick note and say what an honor it is to be able to share my dissertation research here because um, I am a, a, a KU alumna and I have very fond memories of my undergraduate art history courses here. So thank you all. At its unveiling on October 31st, 1935, Mario Cironi's enormous mural, Italy Among the Arts and Sciences, dominated a university lecture hall, revealing immediately recognizable symbols of fascism. 
Cironi's enormous fresco, still standing today, spans 295 feet across and was one of the most prestigious mural commissions given by the National Fascist Party during the Ventennio, or 20 years of fascism. It was made for the new Città Universitaria in Rome, which is now known as Sapienza University of Rome. Because the fresco contained fascist iconography, it was promptly covered in the late 1940s and reworked in the 1950s to conceal the humiliation of life under fascist dictatorship. However, in 2015, a group of restorers and art historians decided to reconstruct the once removed elements in Cerrone's mural, inviting a conversation on censorship and controversial works, especially those placed in public view. I argue that Cerrone's mural is simultaneously judged on its relationship to fascist patronage and on its vital contribution to Italy's rich art historical tradition. Lastly, it also serves as a key element to European visual modernism. Because of its restoration of fascist symbology in the 21st century, I also find that works such as this complicate our understanding of and relationship to fascism and neo-fascism and is worth discussing on all fronts. Although many of the Italian murals made during the Ventennio appear problematically imperialist, we can view them in comparison and in contrast to murals and other works created under totalitarian regimes, such as Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. We can also examine their visual conventions in comparison to the older tradition of Italian mural painting and to the 20th century return to order movement. I won't be able to discuss all of those today, the, all of those avenues, um, but they are nonetheless worth mentioning. In looking at the rich iconographical scheme of the mural, I first want to point out the work's stagnant figuration. Who are these statuesque figures and why do they stand frozen in space, expressionless? According to historian Emilio Gentile, the figures in this composition represents not people at all, but they stand as allegorical representations of astronomy, geography, history, literature, and painting. Revealing to the viewer the hallmarks that comprise fascism and its ideals, they position themselves in proud timelessness. At the top of the composition, one figure identified as victory swoops in with futurist like wings and a sword. One of the more relevant representations in the work, this figure wears what looks to be a fascist military helmet, similar in style to those worn by Italian soldiers during the 1935 invasion and ongoing war with Ethiopia. Below victory, two figures share possession of a gray white orb, perhaps indicating the marriage between astronomy and geography. Several figures, both male and female, possess books for reading or writing, and one figure appears to have a blank canvas before her. These figures and accoutrements symbolize elements of history, literature, and painting. All of the figures are clad in ancient Roman garb with some male figures seemingly dressed in authority while others are dressed as slaves or proletariats. The motionless world that Cerrone built is only complete with the more overt symbols of fascist culture. The mural subject matter originally included a fascist eagle, a fascist date connoting the 14th year of fascism, and a representation of a fascist soldier, presumably Mussolini, on horseback. This type of iconography would have been quite common in mural in public murals by 1936, on the outsides and insides of fascist buildings, and in smaller works featured in major exhibitions in the 1930s. Neither this mural nor any of Cerrone's others can be described, though, as naturalistic. Instead, his muralism is a site of what cultural historian Ettore Wagnolardo calls a figurative battlefield of the birth of a political consciousness and state. Although Wagnolardo makes a strong point through this observation, he neglects to recognize that this so-called birth is purely a visual one. Cerrone visually transformed the centuries-long idea of Roman imperialism by amalgamating it with the modern na nationalism, both through his iconography and through the materiality of his muralism. 
seeking to revive mythic narratives, his figural forms and painted motifs became instrumental propaganda that inspired Italy's new political region or religion. He achieved this success, I argue, more than any other artist working uh, for the fa Italian fascist regime. 1935 into 1936 were critical years for the establishment of a recognizable Italian fascist iconography as global fascism intensified throughout parts of Europe, particularly Germany and Spain. Both Nazi Germany and fascist Italy claimed aspects of the Greek and Roman classical tradition. Cerrone opting to represent Italy as a female version of Emperor Augustus in several of his murals. His overlapping of classical and fascist iconography intended to culturally legitimize the illegitimate dictatorship. But it also lined up with the return to order uh, precedent established by Cerrone's contemporaries in France, such as artists in Italy like Giorgio de Chirico, affiliated with uh, the metaphysical school. Cerrone was also author of one of the principal texts on modern Italian muralism, the 1933 Manifesto of Mural Painting, also signed by painters Massimo Campilli, Carlo Carrà, and Achille Puni. Despite Cerrone's reference to muralism as mural painting, the term was synonymous in his mind with any form of decoration dependent structurally and visually on the wall, be it fresco, mosaic, or bas-relief, for instance. In his manifesto, Cerrone underscored the rediscovery of such ancient techniques as fresco painting, mosaic, and tempera and caustic. He spoke of techniques as being critical to national artistic heritage. However, more important to Cerrone than just fresco's technical value was the public and contextual significance that muralism held. He believed specifically that fresco painting was capable of rendering the traditions and the spirit of the Italian and fascist communities, with murals serving as a gateway between the Italian public and fascist lifestyle. He wrote in an unpublished draft of the manifesto, quote, the return to mural painting means a return to Italian examples and to our tradition, to which it is now impossible to actually connect, despite the fact that so often we feel its fascinating modernity and we can sense the powerful drive that could come to modern art from its example and its discipline, end quote. What Cerrone came to realize in this publication was a new problem in painting, one that could be solved through modern techniques and new definitions of Italian painting, especially as Italian painting had so bitterly been overshadowed by French easel painting for several centuries. By embracing the ancient traditional techniques, ones that specifically belonged to the ancient Roman Empire, Cerrone simultaneously refused trends of 19th century easel painting. An opinion shared unanimously among the new group of Italian muralists, artists began rejecting their easels for an opportunity to paint directly on the wall, despite their past media choices and political ideas. The muralists agreed to paint for clearly defined spaces, to build relationships with prominent architects, and to contribute to a synthesis among the arts. Although it served as a source for inspiration and vision among his colleagues, Cerrone's manifesto became the target of controversy among architects, artists, urban planners, and various uh, administrators of fascist bureaucracy. Some of these controversies brought to light questions about mural painting and its function in the 1930s. Artists questioned how mural art and its various techniques could relate to the question of modernity and whether or not fresco could be categorized as a form of modern painting. Complicating things even further, bureaucrats questioned how muralism could be considered fascist art when the very term fascism was still being debated in 1936. Also important is the larger historical context of the Italian colonization of parts of Africa during the Bentennial. Our historian Simonetta Fraquelli argues that Cerrone's Italy Among the Arts and Sciences mural and his Fascist Italy mosaic shown here, completed in 1937, both allude specifically to Italy's recent victory in Ethiopia. Just as that winged victory figure with the fascist soldier's helmet symbolically unionizes contemporary Italy with imperial Rome, 
as does the iconography in this mosaic. Cerrone's murals thus visually connect directly to fascist ambitions in imperialism and colonialism, as declared in government-controlled newspapers and in Mussolini's speeches. Ruth Ben-Ghiat and Mia Fuller argue in their book on Italian colonialism that the col colonialist enterprise was central to the construction of nationhood and that fascist bureaucracy believed that Mediterranean conquests would result in geopolitical shifts that would pull Italy out of the periphery of Western Europe. Cerrone's mural acts not only as a visualization of the new Italian fascist empire, but in the moment it served to mislead Italian fascist believers in colonialism. His works visually argued that the expansion of empire would pr provide an escape from a subordinate international position when in reality, the Italian state went almost bankrupt in 1936 after Italy invaded and conquered Ethiopia and proclaimed their official empire. Although Italian fascist architecture is a rich subject on its own, it does play a significant role in the development of modern Italian muralism, and particularly for Cerrone's Sapienza mural. During the mid-1930s, Cerrone often collaborated with Marcello Piacentini, one of the top architects for the regime, and together Cerrone and Piacentini were recognized for having constructed a new fascist monumentality. Piacentini, author of the periodical called Architecture, designed the Sapienza University campus with 11 other architects, and through the spectrum of his architectural projects under the regime, he claimed that at last, Italian architecture had finally discovered its character thanks to the unifying spirit of fascism. Due to the devastation and violence resulting from World War II, Cerrone's mural was terribly damaged in the late 1940s, and it was promptly concealed by a thick paper glued to the surface of the fresco. A photograph here ironically shows a large group dedicated to uplifting post-war Italian socialism in a space once devoted to fascism. Several years later in 1950, the architect Piacentini commissioned an academic painter to eliminate all of the symbols in Cerrone's fresco that expressly referred to fascism. Piacentini, like many ex-fascists, had made a rapid and public ideological conversion and then he became an architect of Republican and Christian Democratic Italy in the two decades following World War II. The fascist symbols in the mural were eliminated by Carlo Sibiero, a devout anti-fascist, ashamed over all of the visual and very public representations praising Mussolini's regime. Sibiero's restoration resulted in the removal of the uh, representation of Mussolini on horseback, the eagle, and the fascist state. More recently, efforts have been undertaken by restorers and art historians to reconstruct those removed elements in Cerrone's mural. By 2017, the fascist state, the arch, the eagle, and Mussolini on horseback had once again reappeared. The restoration required two years of work and a publication came out alongside a 2017 exhibition outlining the three important moments of the painting. The original execution in 1935, the repainting in 1950, and the result at the conclusion of the restoration in 2017. Following this reconstruction, tons of critical debates about censorship and conservation efforts abounded on controversial works such as this mural. A variety of writers for prominent newspapers in Italy and the US demanded to know why it was necessary to spend time and money on resurrecting symbols of fascism. But for the art historian and conservationist, restoring and returning a work to its origins is at times an incontestable impulse. After the 2017 debates about the restoration of the work, Ruth Ben Ghiat, a prominent cultural historian and activist, wrote an article for The New Yorker explaining how Italian society has yet to reckon with history because the nation never tore down its fascist buildings, statues, and insignia that still stand in public locations in Rome, Milan, and other cities and communities. As she points out in her article, Italy was the first fascist state in the 1920s, and also was the first to bring a neo-fascist party to power in the 1990s. 
she revealed that Germany enacted a law in 1949 against Nazi apologism, banning Hitler salutes and other pub public rituals and Third Reich symbols. France changed the names of all the streets named after Nazi collaborators. And the US has engaged in a controversial process of removing Confederate statues. Yet, Italy has allowed many fascist monuments to not only survive, but thrive in public view. One reason for Italy's neglect to remove all of the fascist structures and works of art is that there are just so many of them. In my dissertation research alone, I have counted over 125 documented murals constructed during the Ventennio, which is not counting architecture and other fascist visual culture. Some of the spaces created for fascist events have since been adapted for non-political events. So for instance, Foro Italico in Rome, um, Leor in Rome, and then the site of the 1940 colonial exhibition in Naples are now respectively used to host sporting events, office spaces, and large conferences. It's also worth noting that not all of these monuments that still stand today appear immediately fascist. As art historian Marla Stone argues, Italian fascist culture was different from that of other totalitarian regimes because it worked under an agreed aesthetic pluralism, where artists and architects could continue utilizing modern stylistic conventions just as long as their work was in no way anti-fascist. In my research experience, there are many state-funded commissions that are unrecognizably fascist, so the lines at best hazy between fascist and simply modern. Um, regarding Italian works made during the fascist era. 21st century government leaders in Italy, particularly Laura Boldrini, once president of the lower house of parliament, spent much of her energy lobbying for the removal of public symbols and fascism in Italy. In 2015, Boldrini proposed to remove an inscription of Mussolini's name on an obelisk at Foro Italico. You can see it here, the bottom left. Other members of parliament feared that by removing his name, the public work of art would be ruined. These debates are still happening today. While art historians and conservators restore visual symbols of fascism, like in Cerrone's mural, there are also activist artists in Italy who strive to cover neo-fascist and neo-Nazi vandalism and graffiti. One muralist, Pier Paolo Spinazze, who goes by the name of Chibo, which is the Italian word for food, has made a name for himself covering racist and offensive graffiti with illustrations of delicious Italian food. He travels all over the Italian peninsula covering offensive writings and symbols, but asks for little in return. Like his 20th century muralist predecessors, he creates these works because he feels that this is the most fruitful thing for the Italian public at the moment. He said in an interview from 2019, whilst other artists raise awareness on the issue, I am on the streets trying to solve it. They produce works that cost thousands of euros. I ask for bartering. They are surrounded only by curators in their art galleries. I am standing in the crowd, end quote. In conclusion, public works such as Cerrone's Italian Italy Among the Arts and Sciences offer an opportunity for us to reflect on the global fight to refuse fascism. It is quite apparent that public art, especially muralism, is one vehicle that reveals to us complicated histories, iconographic schemes, and visual conventions. These works, along with their continuing debates, also shape our current understanding of the past and present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley, for sharing your thought-provoking research. I am Catherine White, another graduate student in the Crest Foundation Department of Art History and your second moderator for tonight. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to give the audience a few seconds to refresh their webpage in order to load the YouTube chat box. If the YouTube chat box is currently not working for you, please take a moment to refresh your page and it should be functional. We welcome you to submit your questions and comments to the chat box throughout our speakers' presentations, which we will return to after the presentations in our Q&A session. Now we will hear from Rachel Quist. Rachel is a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas, specializing in pre-modern Japanese and Chinese Buddhist imagery. 
Her research centers on interactions with imagery, materiality, and object agency, and the accessibility of image-based ritual practices. Rachel is currently conducting dissertation research on early imperial patronage of Daigoji, a Shingon temple in Kyoto. Please join me in welcoming Rachel for her presentation, Layering Mandala Realms, Empowering the Sanboin Miroku. Hello, and thank you for tuning into my talk, Layering Mandala Realms, Empowering the Sanboin Miroku. I'm just going to share my screen. And I'll get started. So I'm planning to integrate this research into my dissertation, uh, which is uh, going to address imperial and elite patronage of the Shingon Temple Daigoji in the 10th through the 12th centuries. On the main altar of Daigoji's Sanboin, flanked between portrait sculptures of Kobo Daishi and Rigen Daishi, a seated Miroku Bosatsu dated to 1192, serves as the temple's main image, or Honzon. Its current placement between founders of Japanese Shingon Buddhism and the Daigoji complex and the Daigoji complex suggest a layout com commonly used in the initiation rites practiced by the Sanboin lineage of Shingon. However, its origins lie in a no longer extant temple in Daigoji's upper precinct called Kakutoin. Made at the outset of the Kamakura era, this Miroku served as the main image in a memorial ritual held for the deceased retired emperor Goshirakawa who passed away in the third month of Kenkyu III, which corresponds to the year 1192. An inscription at the sculpture's base reveals that Daigoji Abbot Shoken commissioned the work from the Buddhist sculptor Kaike for this purpose. Shoken, son of Goshirakawa's late advisor, Fujiwara no Michinori, belonged to an elite network of monks with noble ties and worked closely with the retired emperor and the imperial family in his roles as the head of the Sanboin cloister and Daigoji as a whole. This paper explores the Sanboin Miroku's inventive design, arguing that the icon's patron, Shoken, devised its multi-layered iconography with not only ritual, but also personal and political motivations. The icon achieves an elegant synthesis of its subject's identity as Miroku in the attire and framework of the cosmic Buddha Dainichi Nyorai. In doing so, it overlaps the diamond world and womb world mandalas, two diagrams of the Buddhist cosmos that embody Dainichi himself. Using Pamela D. Winfield's framework of intericonicity, which I will discuss shortly, I examine the ways in which this image transposes central elements from each of the two world mandalas to generate a sacred realm emanating from the icon. The next section builds on this layering of identity, exploring the ways that this design mirrors contemporaneous anxieties of the late 12th century especially as they pertain to nobles such as Goshirakawa. Through its synthesis of Miroku and Dainichi, the Sanboin Miroku evokes the ideal of the Chakravartin, or wheel-turning king, simultaneously framing the icon within a mandala that provides the ritual context for the consecration of this universal monarch. In composing this design, Shoken effectively carried out the posthumous apotheosis of the retired emperor, asserting Daigoji's place as a central site in imperial funerary practices. The iconography of the Sanboin Miroku demonstrates a high degree of symbolic layering in its design. Miroku Bosatsu sits in a meditative posture with his hands folded in his lap, forming the Dharma realm meditation mudra. A Gorinto reliquary rests on his palms and an ornate mandorla encircles him. While this basic iconography appears in several ritual guides of the 12th to 13th centuries, this is the earliest known sculptural depiction of Miroku holding a stupa while making this mudra. Miroku sits on an intricate multi-tiered lotus pedestal added in 1625. Of particular interest to scholars, his apparel combines the finery of a bodhisattva with the humble Tsugen robe worn by a Buddha. This merging of bodhisattva and Buddha identities stands out particularly when applied to Miroku because of the deity's shifting roles as a bodhisattva who reigns over the pure land Tosotsu and as the Buddha of the future who will descend upon earth millions of years after the extinction of the present Buddha and restored the Dharma to a degenerate world. Nine transformation Buddhas, or Kebutsu, adorn the border of the Mandorla, each figure seated, seated on a lotus pedestal borne by a cloud. Five of the current Kebutsu are later additions, but the Mandorla itself is original to the sculpture. 
According to the 14th century document Record of the Precious Spoken Tradition, compiled by Daigoji Monk Ryoson, the original configuration of the icon's kebutsu comprised the four perfection bodhisattvas flanking a seated Dainichi Nyorai at the apex of the mandorla. As you can see, Dainichi sits at the peak, clasping his right hand over the index finger of his left, forming the wisdom fist mudra. Ryoson notes that in combining these features, the sculpture references the two world mandalas. On the interior of the Sanbo in Miroku, a lacquer inscription details that Shoken commissioned the image and it was completed in 1192. Three months later, it served as the main icon in a memorial service. The inscription closes with a signature used by Kaike between 1192 and 1203. These lines relay the identities of the three central figures to this image's creation, the patron Shoken, the sculptor Kaike, and the deceased retired emperor Goshirakawa, subject of the 1192 memorial service referenced in the inscription. The icon also contains at least one sculptural deposit, a crystal Gorinto reliquary placed inside the top knot above the crown of the head, visible here in this X-ray photo. The image's multi-layered iconography elegantly captures the concept of inter-iconicity, formulated by Pamela D. Winfield, which appears throughout the imagery of Shingon sites. Inter-iconicity describes the practice of inserting icons from one context into the framework of another. Her discussion focuses largely on the transposition of figures between the two world bandalas, a pair of images that illustrate the entirety of the Buddhist cosmos in a series of palatial courts. The womb world mandala and diamond world mandala respectively express Dainichi Nyorai's compassion and wisdom. In each image, Dainichi takes the central position while the other figures serve as his emanations. Central to Shingon understanding of the two world mandalas is their non-duality or interdependence. This principle of non-duality extends beyond the mandalas to the entirety of the Shingon Buddhist cosmos as the universal body of Dainichi composes all things in existence, beings and phenomena alike. Art historians Unno Hiroyuki and Yamaguchi Ryusuke have noted that the iconography of this Miroku and his mandorla make reference to, the da to Dainichi's form in the two world mandalas. Mm -hmm. Dainichi is richly attired in each mandala and wears a five wisdoms crown. In the womb world mandala, he sits with his hands in the Dharma realm mudra. The Sanbo in Miroku makes the same gesture, following the iconography of womb world's Dainichi closely, with the exception of his plain robes and the stupa in his palms. On the other hand, in the Diamond World Mandala, Dainichi Nyorai forms the Wisdom Fist Mudra, and the four perfection bodhisattvas encircle him, which may sound familiar. The uppermost kebutsu of the Sanbo in Miroku Mandorla makes the same mudra, and the initial grouping featured four surrounding figures, not nine, meaning that the Sanbo in Miroku's original four kebutsu reconfigure Dainichi's central assembly in the Diamond World Mandala. Therefore, the image and the, uh, the icon in the mandorla can be understood as layering the mandalas, expressing the essential principle of the non-duality of the two world mandalas. Another important component in the interrelation of Dainichi and Miroku imagery takes place at, uh, as the Gorinto in Miroku's hands. Though the Gorinto is not original to the icon, the third fascicle of the collected iconogra iconographic illustrations compiled by Shouken's contemporary Kozen details that the original icon held an Im a reliquary stupa as well. While no known records identify the stupa, I propose that it likely took a form that evokes Dainichi, either as a gorinto or a hoto, meaning jeweled stupa. The gorinto is Dainichi's sanmaya form, the attribute that embodies him, and its elemental symbolism appears throughout the two world mandalas as an expression of Dainichi's universal body. The equation of Miroku with Dainichi through the use of the Gorinto also occurs in later Kamakura images, such as this miniature shrine at Kuozanji, suggesting that a homologous relationship developed between Miroku and Dainichi and the Gorinto by the time of its creation between the late 12th and 14th centuries. The jeweled stupa carries associations with both deities as well. It embodies Dainichi in one of the Diamond World Mandala's several courts simultaneously serving as one of the symbolic attributes that evokes the Sanmaya form of Miroku. Several 12th century depictions of Miroku show him holding a jeweled pagoda with Dainichi on its surface. The Hoto, which can symbolize both Dainichi and Miroku, would thus effectively echo the non-duality of the two deities expressed by this icon as well. 
Beyond layering of identities, the Sanbo in Miroku does more than reference non-duality. It establishes a, an empowered Dharma realm by layering one mandala over the other. As religious scholar Robert Scharf has demonstrated, while the two world mandalas function in part as diagrams of the Buddhist cosmos, they perform an active role as well. Shingon imagery eliminates the boundary between the signifier and signified. In other words, an icon is animate rather than representative. The two world mandalas function as assemblies of divinities that comprise the entirety of the cosmos, thus establishing a sacred realm and empowering the area they inhabit. In such a space, the worshiper can realize their own essential unity with the divine. By overlaying the two world mandalas in one sculpture, the Sanbo in Miroku actualizes a Dharma realm within the place of worship, and its very presence holds the power to enlighten the beholder. The stupa in Miroku's hands, which evokes the universal body of Dainichi, establishes its axis mundi. This transformative power of the two mandalas also plays an essential role in Shoken's conceptualization of the icon's memorial function. Daigoji enjoyed a close relationship with the imperial family through the Heian period, with legendary 12th century or 10th century origins in its founder Shobo's creation of an icon that aided in the birth of Emperor Daigo's two heirs. In a study of a gorinto interred at Daigoji that was made to house the remains of imperial consort Kenshi, Hank Glassman shows that Daigoji also served the imperial family's funerary needs. Glassman suggests that under the guidance of the Daigoji monk Gihan, Emperor Shirakawa interred Kenshi in a vessel that embodies Dainichi Nyorai in order to enact Kenshi's transformation as a Buddha. Glassman describes the repurposing of this burial practice, previously reserved for renowned monks, as a strategy for the realization of emperor as Dharma king. This paper discusses the Sanbo in Miroku in a similar light, examining the multi-layered meanings that Shoken applied in his selection of iconography to carry out the retired emperor's apotheosis. The efficacy of the image would in turn guarantee the continued role of Daigoji as a site for imperial funerary practices. Various depictions of Miroku in iconographic guides depict him in a manner similar to the Sanboin icon, but no known precedent exists that combines the regal adornments of a bodhisattva with a Buddha's tsugen robe worn over both shoulders. As the image's patron and abbot of Daigoji, Shoken could exert such agency in devising iconographies. Moreover, scholar Michael Jamins locates Shoken at the center of a network of late Heian and early Kamakura period monks renowned for their composition and compilation of iconographic manuals, thus indicating Shoken's own participation in such undertakings. His standing and closeness with the retired emperor put him in an ideal position to impart Goshirakawa's memorial icon with both religious and personal significance. Of central importance to Shoken's concept for the Sanbo in Miroku, the layering of Dainichi and Miroku's identities reflects associations between emperor and Buddha evoked by both deities. Not only in Japan, but also in China and Korea, Miroku carried associations with the Chakravartin, an idealized Buddhist sovereign under whose reign Miroku would descend to earth. Beyond doctrinal associations, rulers in China, Korea, and Japan demonstrated an interest in linking themselves with Miroku. In the late Northern Wei period, a sculpture of the deity was made in honor of Emperor Xiaowen, and in 498, Xiaowen's son and cousin also respectively commissioned sculptures of this deity on behalf of their parents. Fifth century ruler King Mu of Pekche perpetuated the idea that the future Buddha would descend to earth during his reign in an attempt to assert his status as a Chakravartin. Pekche monks later transmitted worship of this, of this Bodhisattva to Japan in the sixth century where elite lay people received him eagerly. Posthumous records of the seventh century Japanese emperor Tenji indicate his fervent desire for rebirth in Tosotsu. Through the, though the accuracy of these records remains uncertain, they demonstrate an early perception among elite audiences of Miroku's soteriological efficacy. Further indicating Miroku's popularity among seventh and eighth century nobles, Janet Goodwin notes that by the close of the eighth century, each of Nara's seven great temples, all established by imperial or noble patrons, enshrined Miroku icons. In 11th century Japan, Miroku worship resurged, particularly in response to anxiety over the onset of an age of decline called Mapo or the end of the Dharma. This describes the period in which the degradation of the Dharma in this epoch is complete. The turmoil of the 12th century in which Japan underwent severe famines, natural disasters, and social unrest 
cemented these concerns. Whereas worship of Miroku had previously centered on the desire for rebirth in his Pure Land Tosotsu, focus shifted to his role as the future Buddha, who would restore stability and peace. In elite circles of the late Heian era, the practice of burying sutras in preparation for Miroku's descent became increasingly popular. And among these burials, the Lotus Sutra, which emphasizes Miroku's importance, was most common. Koshirakawa adhered to the Lotus Sutra, making Miroku an appropriate deity for his memorial icon on a personal level. Koshirakawa lived in a period typified by imperial instability and the rising influence of warrior clans. The cyclical nature of the Miroku narrative, in which a future Buddha arises millennia after the departure of a previous Buddha and restores order, led many Japanese nobles in the 12th century to yearn for his descent. Koshirakawa himself exhibited nostalgic impulses in his Buddhist patronage. In 1181, he launched an effort to solicit funds from the public, referred to as a kanjin campaign, for the restoration of Todaiji. Janet Goodwin has argued that the symbolic value of the populace uniting to restore the imperial institution at Goshirakawa's behest held far more value to him than the monetary contributions themselves. Goshirakawa likely sought to draw parallels between himself and Todaiji's founder, Emperor Shomu, who employed a kanjin campaign to fund the temple's initial construction. For both emperors, a kanjin campaign sought to grant secular and religious legitimacy to the imperial office by unifying the nation under the directives of their pious Buddhist sovereign. Goshirakawa even painted in the eyes of the new great Buddha, just as Shomu had in 752. Personal piety notwithstanding, Goshirakawa took a strategic approach to patronage, attempting to reinstate the legitimacy and stability of the imperial lineage through nostalgic invocations of himself as the ideal Buddhist sovereign. Goshirakawa's fervent worship of the Lotus Sutra and his position as the self-aware head of a waning imperial household made Miroku an ideal figure for his memorial icon. Miroku's associations with the Chakravartin and the restoration of a storied world order were particularly attractive to nobles of his period. Furthermore, Shoken commissioned this image at a point when many Shingon monks attempted to counter the growing influence of Pure Land schools of Buddhism by promoting Miroku, addressing both his own Pure Land Tosotsu and his eventual role as the Buddha of the future age. Finally, as a monk of noble patronage, whose father died violently due to the volatility of late Heian era politics, Shoken himself may have harbored a sense of yearning for the stability of bygone years to be restored during the age of Miroku. Unno Hiroyuki suggests that Miroku's blended appearance as a bodhisattva in a Buddha's robe evokes the process of receiving esoteric precepts and achieving Buddhahood. In this light, Shoken may have designed the icon in part with the intent of calling forth the moment of transformation in which Miroku attains Buddhahood and, and reestablishes order. The Sanboin Miroku's dual role as an emanation of Dainichi Nyorai's womb world and diamond world forms also carries significant weight, significant weight in the icon's actualization of Goshirakawa's apotheosis. His appearance in the icon echoes the elevation of a terrestrial monarch to a celestial being. On an iconographic level, the depiction of a crowned Buddha, such as Dainichi, in the two world mandalas invokes the conflation of Chakravartin and Buddha which in turn promotes the ideal of secular and sacred power as unified under the reign of the emperor, a goal of Goshirakawa's. As Unno, as Unno asserts, the Sanboing Miroku evokes esoteric initiation rites by depicting a bodhisattva transforming into a Buddha. In Shingon worship, these rites also recall the concentration of a monarch, the consecration of a monarch, as the tradition draws from an ancient Indian practice of sprinkling water from the four seas onto the head of a sovereign to assert his rule over the four directions. In an esoteric Buddhist framework, the ritual places an initiate within the boundaries of a mandala, another quality, quality that the Sanboin Miroku shares with precept rites. The body of Miroku in the garb of Dainichi wearing a five wisdoms crown synthesizes both deities roles as expressions of earthly and cosmic sovereignty. Dainichi also plays an essential role in cementing the image's expression of the two world mandalas within a contained sculptural manifestation. As Winfield explains, inter iconicity in Shingon imagery amalgamates the two world mandalas through, mu through mutual transposition of elements from one image upon the other. The Sanboin Miroku synthesizes Miroku and Dainichi, 
and the devices it employs to do so also enact the interdependent relationship of the mandalas. In doing so, it situates the icon within an empowered matrix. Shoken's design thus provides not only the bodily iconography, but also the symbolic framework within which retired Emperor Goshirakawa's consecration can occur in the context of esoteric initiatory rites. The Sanboi Miroku thus performs a transformative role similar to that of the Kenshi Gorinto, which carried, out, which carried out the consort's posthumous attainment of Buddhahood. Daigoji's status as a temple intrinsically linked with the imperial family lends additional significance to Shoken's efforts in designing a suitable memorial icon for Goshirakawa. As in the case of the Kenshi Gorinto, the Sanboin image establishes a generative space further empowered by the stupas he holds in his head and his hands. The Gorinto within the head embodies Dainichi and contains enlivening relics. Additionally, while its exact form remains unknown, the stupa in the icon's hands becomes an exterior marker of the, of the axis mundi, cementing the image's role as a mandala. The interdependence of the body, the stupa, and the mandala as cosmic matrices suggests that these stupas establish a transformative sphere, elevating the deceased to Buddhahood on an interior and exterior level. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for such a terrific talk. So our next presenter tonight is Tina Zhen Zhang. Tina is a first year master student in art history from the University of Iowa. And she specializes in Chinese art, especially the art books produced during the pre-modern era. Today, she will present her research on a Chinese literati book project in the Qing Dynasty that catalogs thousand song paintings. Please join me to welcome Tina for her presentation, Replicate or Counterfeit, a research on catalog of Southern Song Academy paintings. Here you go, Tina. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'm sharing my screen. Okay, hello everyone. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. Before I start, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Symposium Planning Committee, Committee for helping me better prepare the presentation. Thank you very much. My topic today is Replicate or Counterfeit, a case study on the catalog of Southern Song academic painting. This is a case study focusing on one ancient Chinese art catalog edited in the 18th century. In the next 20 minutes, I will first introduce this book and then argue about the problematic citation in this book by four supporting examples. And finally, explore more materials to give further analysis. First is the introduction. Catalog of Southern Song Academic Painting is an ancient Chinese art catalog edited by a member of the literati, Li e, of the Qing Dynasty in the 18th century. In the later slides, I will use CSSAP to represent this book. The catalog of Southern Song Academic Painting is of tremendous historical importance because it is a comprehensive early source to describe academic painting from the Southern Song Dynasty. However, Li E's book is a hodgepodge of earlier writings. He unusually relied on quantities of other books and seldom gave his own comments. In this case study, I argue that many of these citations in the book are problematic are problematic. Li E intentionally altered some original sources he cited, resulting in the reinterpretation or misinterpretation. He also cited a number of other highly questionable sources, some of which might even be fabricated, compromising the credibility of his book. The earliest version of this book is the Zhi Bu Zhu Zhai version copied by Li E's contemporary Bao Tingbo. This book is now preserved in Beijing National Library. 
Bao claimed that he got the original draft of Li'er's book and copied it in his studio, Zhi Bu Zhu Zhai. He also proofread this book and add many inscriptions in the book. The picture on the right shows uh, one page of this book. As we can see, the content is uh, written within the books. From right to left, it starts with the book title on the top and the editor's name below. Then it shows uh, one chapter title, which is introduction here on this page, and it follows by the detailed context. The two square cells within the books belong to Bao Tingbo, which shows the ownership of this manuscript. And the notes on the margin here was written by Bao Tingbo. My study mainly relies on this version and I will show more pages about it later. The catalog of Southern Song academic painting belongs to a long tradition of art catalogs in China, which first appeared in the fifth century and continued to develop during the following centuries. Because art catalogs usually include a wide range of information, such as artist biographies, description of works of art, critics, and theories. Modern scholars often refer to this book as credible sources. However, art catalogs are not neutral documents. The catalog of Southern Song academic painting is one typical example among them. Through this case study, I try to demonstrate that such sources are themselves worth starting to better understand not only their content, but also the art historical context in which they were produced. The central argument of my presentation is that Li e selected, altered, and adapted his source to meet his editorial agenda of glorifying Southern Song academic painting as a way to bring honor to Liu's home city of Hangzhou, the old capital of Southern Song. Therefore, this book serves as a reminder that Southern Song academic painting still played an influential role in the Qing art despite its unpopularity in mainstream art criticism, dominated by the theory of Southern and Northern school proposed by Dong Qichang and his followers. Furthermore, its unusual composition offers insight into the practice of creating new text by collecting and editing old ones in the Qing dynasty. Having a close reading of this book, we can find two types, of pro, uh, two types of problems. The first type is the alteration of the citation. Although this situation is understandable, since Li e might aim at picking the sentences related to Solon Song academic painting, so he dropped the rest but Li E's alteration is more than that. For example, in the first volume of Li E's book, he cited one fragmented message says, the most difficult genre of painting is architectural painting. Painters such as Wei Xian, Ma Yuan, Xia Gui, and Wang Zhengpeng are all well known for this. In the original text, which is from Xiangzu Bizi, a notebook written by Wang Shizheng, it is almost the same at first, but it has an extra sentence at the end that says, but this kind of painting is not valuable. Li E picks the beginning of the text because it mentions the architectural painting, 
also known as the ruler painting. This is one genre of academic painting. The picture on the right here shows an example of architectural painting by an academic painter, Li Song, from the Southern Song Dynasty. Meanwhile, Ma Yuan and Xia Gui here are two well-known academic artists from the Southern Song Dynasty. However, Liu intentionally cut off the end of the second sentence when the author emphasized his attitude. Liu not only changed the author's original meaning, but also prevented academic art from being criticized, resulting in the misinterpretation of the original text. A similar example appears in the second volume. When introducing Li Di, another Southern Song academic artist, Li Yue cited the inscription from Gu Shi Hua Pu, an illustrated book on paintings. It says, Li Di's small scale painting on flower, bird, bamboo, and stone are lively. When watching them, I unconsciously think of Taoist idea about how and poo reverse. The original source is almost the same, but it also has an extra sentence at the end says, but his landscape painting is not that good. The picture on the right shows an example of Li Di's painting on chicken. Here, Li E intentionally deleted the comment on Li Di's shortcoming. Li E seems to be consciously promoting Southern Song academic painting. So he includes messages that support his promotion and omits those on the opposite. The second type of problem in catalog of Southern Song academic painting is a questionable citation. Li E might take a very inclusive approach to the text he cited to include a wide range of material on Southern Song academic painting. And it did not rigidly proofread his sources. For example, in the fifth volume of this book, Li E cited one record of Li Song's painting of peddlers from Shu Huazi written by Wu Qizhen in the Ming Dynasty. It says, Li Song's painting of peddlers is a handsome silk hand school painting. It has an inscription of 10 words saying, Li Song, the son of Li Tongxun, drew this painting in the fourth year of Jia Ding. Bao Tingbo, Liu's contemporary questioned this record and made one note saying, although Li Song is the adopted son of Li Tongxun, how dare he call the full name of his foster father? Besides, I have never seen such an inscription before. This painting must be a counterfeit. Wu Qizhen was a merchant who sold paintings and calligraphy and he knew nothing about connoisseurship. So he put this painting into his book. Bao Tingbo believed the painting of peddlers in the record was a counterfeit. One of the reasons he proposed strongly is that the signature in the painting widers the culture taboo that the son was not allowed it to mention his father's full name out of respect in promoting China. As a well-educated man like Bao Tingbo, Li E should have noticed the doubt in the record. However, Li E added this questionable record into his book without making any remarks as Bao did. In some cases, Li E even relied on some books filled with fabricated information, compromising the credibility of his book. 
One typical example is a catalog of precious painting, a main art catalog written by Zhang Taijie. The catalog of precious painting is notorious for its collection of fake paintings, as noted by critics as early as the 18th century. Bao Tingbo also found this main art catalog problematic. In the margin of the first volume of Li E's book, Bao wrote, looking at the catalog of precious painting carefully, all the paintings mentioned in this book are fabricated works. I once printed this book in my workshop at home and have been regretting it. However, Li E cited the data from this book dozens of time. He also used this book as a source to authenticate paintings. According to the four examples discussed above, it is obvious that many citations in Li E's book are problematic. Li E not only intentionally deleted a part of the text he cited, but also cited a number of highly questionable information into his book. By avoiding negative information of academic painting and artists, Li E presents Tate Southern Song academic painting in a favorable light. Such prejudice also motivated Li E to overlook questionable aspects of certain sources and use them regardless to support his message. Therefore, the catalog of Southern Song academic painting is not a neutral text textual compilation of Southern Song academic painting. Li E's choice to include or omit specific text reveals his critical agenda, which is proved in his preference. The picture on the right shows Li E's preference in Zhi Bu Zhu Zhai version, which is missing in later versions. In this preference, Li E highly frees the continuous emergence of skilled artists in Southern Song Academy, arguing that their art inherited the respondents during the rule of Emperor Huizong from the Northern Song Dynasty. Li E also distinguished Southern, Southern Song academic painting from painting made for recreation, claiming that they have moral and educational purpose. However, Leo's portrayal of Southern Song academic painting is very different from his literati counterparts. Since Dong Qichang's Southern and Northern School theory became popular in the Ming Dynasty, academic painting had been deemed less worthy than literati painting produced by scholar amateur artists. The two pictures here respectively, respectively show the example of academic painting and literati painting. Art critics considered professional court artists inferior because they lacked the intellectual ability required to produce art of their highest quality. Leo's promotion of Southern Song academic painting and the deviation from mainstream Qing art criticism is unusual. His preference gives one sound reason. He came from Hangzhou, the old capital of Southern Song. I argue that Li E had a cultural affinity with his hometown, so most of his writings are about it. Here I list some of his other writings. Those writings include landscape poems of Hangzhou, local gazetteo founded by the government, and other books related to the culture and history of Hangzhou or Song Dynasty. According to Li E's preference, he wrote 
the catalog of Solonson academic painting because he regretted the fact that many Solonson academic artists became unknown to the public and he hoped to search for and collect all the records on these artists within his book. Li E was not an artist nor an art historian. He might took the catalog of Southernson academic painting as part of his bigger project to glorify the Southernson dynasty as a way to bring honor to Hangzhou. Therefore, such a gender to promote regional identity trumps the need for rigorous scholarship. The composition of catalog of Southern Song academic painting is essentially a patchwork of sources of varying validity. Li E adapted and cited various pre-existing texts to create a new text. This is an extension of a practice especially prevalent in the late Ming, where commercial publishers reappropriated old books to produce new meanings. Today, the catalog of Southern Song academic painting is still an important reference book for studying Southern Song academic painting, thanks to its inclusion of a wide range of earlier records from the fields of art, literature, and history. It includes some artists that were barely mentioned in the art field before. It also preserves several copies of documents that are hard to find today. A case study on such book helps complicate our understanding of this book as an objective a compilation of information on Southern Song academic painting, and instead frames the text within the reception history of Southern Song academic painting during the early Qing dynasty. Critical reading of such text not only demonstrate that art books are a worse subject of research in their own right, but also complement other approaches in art history in building a deeper understanding of the artwork in pre-modern China. So uh, this is uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, for your great presentation. Our final speaker for the night is Jasmine Benton. Jasmine is in her second year of a PhD program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is interested in how Black artists and Black audiences engage with the idea of the archive. Jasmine's presentation tonight examines the works of Colleen Smith, Carrie Mae Weems, and Alicia Wormsley, and investigates how these Black women artists act out in relation to the creation and presentation of their art. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine for her presentation, Reaching Back, Looking Forward, Acting Out. Hello, thank you, Catherine, I'm Jasmine, and thank you all for being here tonight. This title of this talk is Reaching Back, Looking Forward, Acting Out. Last year, at a virtual screening of her film, Children of Nan Mothership, artist Alicia Wormsley declared, Children of Nan is an archive. It is an archival project, but I would never trust that project to technology. The tech is primitive. The archive is in me. People have asked me, where is the archive housed? And it's housed in me. The real information is in me. The film is an Afrofuturistic tale exploring themes such as motherhood, memory, and kinship. Wormsley's own family and friends perform in it. It's part of a larger archival project that Wormsley has been working on for years. Children of Nan Mothership has a runtime of about an hour and 10 minutes, yet Wormsley claims the film could have been eight hours long. I cut so much because of secrets, she said. I felt like they were secrets. At the screening, she mentioned a future that is built, that a future that she's building that she can show her work in two versions, 
one for Black women, and one for the public. Wormsley is resistant to allow her work to be held in an archive outside of herself. She wishes to shield some of her work from the gaze and consumption of outsiders. I believe this resistance is Wormsley's way of acting out. And I do not mean this term to be infantilizing or punitive. Instead, I see Wormsley's work as part of a genealogy of Black femme performance. Saying no when a yes is expected, deliberately bucking the art world's norms and other ways to resist assimilation are all examples of acting out. And Wormsley's hesitancy to trust her archive to anything outside of herself makes sense when considering the larger context of cultural institutions, such as museums and archives. Traditionally, these institutions have cloistered art and artifacts and profited from that hoarding. This paper considers the questions of how Black women can work to create an archive that is no longer based on the exploitation of our bodies. This question is examined not only through selected, selected work by Colleen Smith, Carrie Mae Weems, and Alicia Wormsley, but by looking at their acts of defiance surrounding their creation and display of said artwork. Each artist directly engages with historical material and ideas, but it is their, their refusal to be held by our traditional archival standards that a possibility arises for new and liberating approaches to the archive. Cultural institutions are currently grappling with the idea of repatriating stolen objects. This noble aim is to correct historical wrongdoings perpetrated in the name of Euro of the Euro-American colonial project. But what about current methods of collecting and display? These methods in which an institution enjoys benefits from an acquisition that an artist may never enjoy perpetuate the extractive origins of the museum. The prototype of the modern day museum and archive is the wonder camera. These pre-enlightenment cabinets of curiosities were status symbols for wealthy whites. Ideally, a white person would travel the world to collect art, objects, animals, including humans, and show off their trophies to their peers. Renderings of foreign sites and people was also helpful in situating the collector's reputation as a worldly individual. After their deaths, the collector's legacy was maintained through their estate, which would include the Wonderkammer. These collections would eventually become the foundation for the, for the first actual museums and dictate how we continue to classify and understand the past. The standards of museology are derived from, from this imperialist game. Consider a visit today to any encyclopedic museum. Entire departments are named after the collectors. The wall text will display information about the provenance of the item without considering the original creator. There'll be a flattening of racial and ethnic diversity. Think terms like African art or Asian art. And they'll often display sacred and esoteric objects. Even the ways that wonder camera trophies are, were displayed is still replicated in today's institutions. Visitors to modern day museums and archives will learn to mimic the oppressive, oppressive languages of the past. And this is evident in our deferral of authority to the collector instead of the community who made the object. And there was also a violence inherent in the voyeuristic nature of the museum and the fetish of the archive. Even the credentialism necessary to enter many archives restricts access based on race and class. Whatever, it, whatever makes it to the attention of the general public has been consciously chosen for display, furthering the hegemonic nature of the institution. So how can an artist resist this system? Wormsley's internal archive is directly in conflict with the way an archive is supposed to exist, as is her understanding of the audience. Another example of this acting out can be found in the creation of Carrie Mae Weems's From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried. This multimedia installation spans generations. The visual and literary series is bookended by mirror images of the same Black woman. Here it is in installation view. And here's a uh, detail. She looks forward and she looks backward through time and space. She narrates her own fate and her own history. From here, I saw what happened, she calls forward, and I cried, she calls back. This textual rumination is illustrated with a series of repurposed photographs that we manipulated with a red tint. Any scholar of United States history will recognize at least a few of these repurposed images which feature black people in various eras and contexts. Among these are four controversial daguerreotypes earned by Harvard University's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. 
and I will not show the daguerreotypes, but here are uh, redacted versions from Christina Sharp's book, In the Wake. So uh, created in 1850, these daguerreotypes were commissioned by a man named Louis Agassiz. Agassiz was a professor at Harvard and he was attempting to use photographic evidence to prove his ideas on the superiority of white people. His method of assigning personality characteristics as well as humanity based on physical features is now referred to as a pseudoscience. Uh, he commissioned photographer J.T. Zeely to create these nude portraits. After Ghazi's death, the detritus of this particular project was donated to the Peabody Museum and forgotten for decades. The museum rediscovered and cataloged the collection in 1976 and they remain some of the most well-known depictions of enslaved people in the United States and hold much notoriety for today's historians with copies, adorning textbooks and other didactic materials. When Weaves encountered the daguerreotypes, she was made aware that it was against the rules of the Peabody Museum to reuse the images without permission, but she did it anyway. When Harvard threatened the art artist with legal action, she replied, I think that I don't really, that I don't, uh, that I don't really have a legal case, but maybe I have a moral case that should be carried out in public. I think that you're suing me would be a really good thing. You should, and we should have this conversation in court. Here, Weems's resistance to the regulations of the Peabody Museum serve as a great example of acting out. It is important to note that the people in the daguerreotypes had no legal control over their own bodies. Their names were Jack, Drana, Rinty, and Delia, and they were considered objects when they were alive. After their portraits made their way into the Peabody collection, they continued to be used as objects to bring value to the museum. By circumventing the typical image use protocols, Weems is refusing to be complicit in the continued exploitation of these people. Her disregard for Harvard's proprietary hold over the images activated them in a new way. They are now part of a conversation about the modern day museum's reliance on violent colonial and anti-Black systems. I believe that Weaves' act constitutes a separate art piece, a performance piece. By publicly defying the rules of the institution, Weaves is engaging in what Yuri McMillan calls performing objecthood. Extending on the work of Horton Spillers and Sadia Hartman, McMillan defines this act as an adroit method of circumventing prescribed limitations on Black women in the public sphere while staging art and alterity in unforeseen places. McMillan continues, Blackness and performance have historically existed via a violent tethering built upon theatrical spectacles of torment that reinforce relationships defined by dominance Muddying, uh, the muddying of the line between free will and force makes it particularly difficult to discern agency, commonly understood as the intentional choices made by humans alone or in collaboration with others. And what is usually a private matter, Weems' action brings to the public issues around the ethics of holding artifacts of an extremely violent past. Harvard chose not to sue Weems, but as she mentioned, they would have had the support of the United States pop of property laws. What does that truly mean given the reality that the United States laws are entrenched in anti-Blackness? Does Harvard's claim to ownership mean anything in the context of contemporary Black life? Harvard's claim is rooted in violence and upheld by violence. The ideology that allowed Agassiz the opportunity to build this collection of images is the same one that allows Harvard to maintain it and allows the state the power to enforce Harvard's will. Weems' defiance is not theft, it is liberation. So there is another player here, the descendants of Renty and Delia. One of these descendants, Tamara Lanier, is involved in her own strategic battle against the power of the museum. She's suing Harvard for restitution of the daguerreotypes and financial compensation for the intergenerational damage done. In addition, Lanier is demanding that Harvard acknowledge that she has been, that it has been complicit in perpetuating and justifying the institution of slavery and bears responsibility to the degradation and humiliation forced upon Renty and Dahlia through its employee and agent, Lou Agassiz. This won't be the first time that Harvard has heard about Lanier's claims 
as she has tried to convince the Peabody Museum of her right to the items numerous times. Instead of acquiescing, Harvard chose to ignore Lanier and has continued to profit from the images. In 2017, Harvard utilized Rinty's portrait and publicity materials for a conference titled Universities and Slavery, Bound by History. Lanier's lawsuit states that this event is the most egregious example of Harvard's ongoing exploitation of Renty and subversion of the truth. Lanier attended this conference and noted that her ancestor's image was captioned, quote, the man you see on this program's front cover, Renty, lived and worked as a slave in South Carolina in 1850 when his photograph was taken for the Harvard professor, Louis Agassiz, as part of Agassiz's scientific research. While Agassiz earned a claim, Rinty turned, returned to invisibility, end quote. Even Harvard's attempt at pulling Rinty from invisibility came from a place of ahistorical paternalism. Harvard elides over Agassiz's research goals and disregards Rinty's living family. He was never made invisible. Lanier's family has kept his story active for generations. Lanier is demanding repatriation as well as reparations. And both demands are incongruent with the ideology of the United States. She's going against the norms and social stru societal structures to act out against continuing historical wrongs. Winning a lawsuit such as this is a long shot. The United States is not in the business of reparations. The far-fetched nature of Lanier's actions make the actions worthwhile by creating a space for other Black women to imagine. Engaging directly with existing archives, Colleen Smith's 2016 work titled Kindred and Vinculum offer another strategy, redaction. Similar to Wormsley, Smith hides certain things from her audience. But unlike Wormsley's goals of keeping these hidden aspects sacred, Smith is using redaction as a method of highlighting her, her instances of acting out. Her short film, Vinculum, is marked by loud beeps and intrusive sensor bars over the images, but it was not originally planned that way. As the preamble Kindred explains, Smith was invited to create new artwork for a 2016 exhibition called Radio Imagination, which was organized in collaboration between the Art Gallery Clock Shop, the Huntington Library, and the estate of the late novelist Octavia E. Butler. This art exhi exhibition was a unique opportunity to democratize access to Butler's papers. As one of the early thinkers in the theories of Afrofuturism, the reach of Butler's work is enormous. She's inspired visual artists, writers, musicians, academics, everyone. It is impossible to overstate Butler's effects on contemporary Black future making. Butler's papers are held at the Huntington Library and are inaccessible to the general public. All researchers wishing to access this collection must be currently working on academic research and complete an application to prove affiliation with a university. Vinculum is Smith's film based on Butler's novel titled Kindred, Butler's 1979 novel titled Kindred, which is about a black woman in the 1970s who was transported back in time against her will. She is forced into slavery and witnesses and interferes with the conditions of her ancestors, both black and white. Butler had no children, but her literary state has sold the film rights to this story and requested that Vinculin not be shown. Just as in the historic Wonder Calmer, the interests of the collector outweigh everything else. Smith's response of redaction where she redacted names and key, key plot points continue in the exhibition catalog where a blank page is printed in lieu of a film still. Quartz and Spillers muses in a recent book review, what if the black woman artist chooses to circumvent her putative cultural affiliations? It seems to me that this radical ambiguity, this discomforting alterity cuts directly against the grain of what is expected of black women as subjects of art and of history. But taking on new expectations and anticipations must be written as well into the framework and scaffolding of possibility. Wormsley, Weems, Lanier and Smith are all working within this space. By refusing to do as told and speaking up when silence is expected 
These women are acting out to build new possible futures. When black, when black women act out together, new worlds can be formed. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jasmine, for your engaging talk. Now um, we are transitioning to our question and answer portion of the session. I would like to ask our presenters to turn the cameras back on and join us for the Q&A session. Welcome back. Nice to see all your faces again. Okay. So now I am going to move forward to the first questions, which is for Ashley, and it is from Professor David Kit Forrest. He says, thank you for such informative and engaging talk. Could you please say more about who paid for the restoration of the Zironi murals and what arguments were made for restoring it? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much for that question, Dr. Kataforis. Um, it's good to hear from you. Um, so the work was restored for the 80th anniversary of Sapienza University, um, which doesn't give us a lot of clues as to you know why the work was restored, but that is that is the the answer that kind of everyone gives. Um, is it like this is the event? Um, this is why this work is being restored. It was the, the people in charge were Eliana Beely, who is an art historian at Sapienza, and then um, Laura D'Agostino, who's the head restorer. Um, they wrote a book together on um, the restoration and they kind of hosted the exhibition. And as far as I can see, um, the, the restoration was funded by MLAC, which is the Museum of Contemporary Art at Sapienza, but I'm quite positive that there are backers behind, um, you know, the museum that I have not yet uncovered, which I think that that would be the answer to the question, which I don't have yet, but <laughs> um, I don't know who those backers are at this time. I do know that um, there was a politician, Sergio Mattarella, who is now the president of the Italian Republic um, since 2015. He's the one who opened the curtain um, to unveil the mural and he was really involved with the Christian democracy for a while. And he's always been seen as a left-wing politician and has supported the Democratic Party. Um, but it's, it's often been argued by journalists that the Democratic Party has consistently been lazy in removing fascist symbology throughout Italy. Um, and as we can see with this restoration here, they, they haven't only been lazy, but they've acted to unveil these um, fascist symbols in a semi-public space. So it's really kind of confusing as to what's going on here. <laughs> Thank you. I have another question for Ashley uh, okay. from Yvonne, um, who says, Ashley, how did you become interested in studying fascist artworks? And do you find it difficult to work closely with such problematic symbols? Yes. <laughs> so um, I guess that kind of goes back to, to my history as an art historian, but um, in my MA program, I was first interested in just generally modern art, modern Italian art. These were my interests. And then um, this kind of immediately put me in close contact with the Italian futurists because, you know, of course, that's just what makes sense um, as an emerging scholar and, and person who wants to understand modern Italian art. Um, and I was searching for some Italian artists who possibly identified as women in the 20th century. So um, few or none of them were in my art history textbooks. So I found Benedetta Cappa Marinetti, who was the wife of F.T. Marinetti, the founder of Futurism. Um, she had created these amazing murals for the Palermo Post Office. Um, I think she finished them in 1934. And upon doing more research on this particular murals, I discovered that there were dozens more like it, like similar um, commissions for these things that, that her work was in dialogue with at this time. Um, so I felt that her work almost deserved discussion within these modern Italian um, murals rather than belonging simply to a discussion on futurism. Um, so that kind of took me out of futurism and into muralism. And then after talking with my advisor and just doing a lot of research over the past few years, 
Um, I had a whole dissertation in front of me on Italian muralism and all of them had been funded by the fascist government. So that's just kind of how I landed in the lap of fascism. Um, very unexpected, not what I had intended to study at all. Um, and it has been difficult, you know, especially with my research abroad, it's difficult to tell Italians that I study Italian fascist culture. Um, and that's just something that I'm grappling with still today. But I do anticipate broadening my research once I graduate to more of like a global focus, um, looking closely at murals made for the popular front in France, WPA murals in the United States, which really there isn't a lot of scholarship on, um, Soviet Russian photo muralism, perhaps even Mexican muralism, even though there's a lot written on that. Um, but there's like this whole dialogue that isn't really happening right now about um, modern muralism and kind of how that relates to broader aspects of 20th century art history. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ashley. Now I'm going to ask questions for Rachel. Okay. So the first question for Rachel comes from Kara Nordergen. And Kara asks, in your conclusion, you argue that the mandala the stupa and the body come together to form a transformative sphere. So could you please elaborate more on that? Thank you, sure. Rachel. Sure, thank you so much for that question, Kara. So um, there, there's, like with my whole paper, there are multiple layers going on. Um, so at the very most surface layer, um, there is this idea, especially in Shingon imagery, that um, to quote uh, the person who brought Shingon to Japan, a monk named Kukai, uh, within a single glance, uh, enlightenment can be attained is, is a paraphrase of it. And it's basically this idea that within especially what's called esoteric Buddhism to which Shingon belongs, there's so much um, deep complexity to, uh, to consider within the textual uh, archive of the religion. But um, imagery can be a way to navigate and to understand things. And beyond that um, importance of imagery, there is the idea that the image is animate, the, the, that a consecrated sacred image actually is and doesn't just represent. And so um, when you have a mandala that, uh, or a pair of mandalas in which their, their purpose is to um, actually not just to depict the Buddhist cosmos uh, or the universe of, of the deities, but to actually bring them into the space in doing so. Um, and, then, uh, and then you have a, a sculpture that, that uh, through referential iconography then creates those two mandalas and casts them onto the body of the sculpture. There are these um, combining features going on. So um, it was the and and another thing to that I'm um, that I didn't get a chance to mention in the talk, but I'm glad that that this came up is that um, both mandalas and stupas can be considered um, these diagrams of the cosmos. And so while a stupa is in one sense either a structure or a reliquary that often um, by definition contains the relics of, uh, of a Buddha and sometimes of other sacred figures. Um, it is also uh, a depiction of, of the universe and thus an enactment of the universe. And so you have these overlapping things that literally create the, the Buddhist cosmos and it's uh, going back to Robert Scharf's uh, scholarship um, a lot of people talk about mandalas in the sense of uh, like, oh, this is for visualization. This helps you picture a Buddha and meditate on a Buddha. There are ways to think about a mandala in that sense, but there's also the fact that the mandala itself is treated in ritual as something that actually creates a sacred space. And so the by, by transposing all of these uh, generative transformative symbols onto one sculpture, um, kind of arguing, well, I'm not kind of arguing, I am arguing that um, the, that this, that this image has this massive kind of power to transform the space around it into a sacred space and to potentially enlighten and to, um, to consecrate the people who approach it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rachel. I have a second question for you from the YouTube chat. Uh, this is from Mary Frances Ivy, who says, Rachel, what a rich presentation. I'd love if you'd share with us about your methodologies. Has the digital archive been generous with you? And what research questions will you take with you to the on-site archive when possible? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mary Frances. So um, in terms of methodology, I kind of, I have, uh, well, I, I've been looking a lot into, in terms of modern scholarship, people that are talking about object agency, the biography of objects and the social life of things. So that last one being a direct refer reference to um, Apadurai. And um, basically I try to implement those types of, of scholarships while also seeing actual Buddhist text and Buddhist ritual as its own methodological stru structure because there is a, and there's an extent to which I'm looking at sources that are from a, a cultural and temporal perspective so far removed from a lot of modern theory that I almost feel, well, I definitely feel as though there's a there's a, a, an extent to which if I apply modern theory too much, I'm just projecting modern perspectives onto people that predate those modern perspectives by centuries. And I want to do, my due diligence to respect the source material as well. And so I am looking at methodologies that include, you know, examining object agency and iconographic studies, but I'm also trying to uh, confront the importance of using source texts like sutras um, and, um, and uh, debates between monks, for example, about whether trees can be sentient. Uh, so there's a really great book uh, by Fabio Rambelli called Buddhist Materiality that has entire chapters on these debates between Buddhist monks in Japan about whether a tree can be considered sentient and um, the kind of ramifications of that discussion. Um, the, the digital icar archive as well has been really helpful, but also there are just um, a lot of really great uh, antho anthology texts uh, about Daigoji's images that I've been using as well. And it's just, really great, especially for finding the X-ray images, for example, like the ones that I showed or images of, of, uh, of inscriptions. There, there's a lot of work that's been done already that I'm very grateful for, uh, just to kind of catalog the, the ins and outs of the sculptures and all sorts of details. And that's been really great for both images and for primary sources. And um, finally, the, there was a question about my field work, right? Um, <laughs> sorry. What questions uh, will you take with you when you're able to go um, in person? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you so much. So um, a lot of what I'm looking at is uh, it relates to the interpersonal relationship between um, a worshiper and an icon. And so while the modern state of an icon is not going to be the same as, you know, when it was first put on an altar and displayed in a temple, um, and also my position in life is very different from the people that would have initially been worshiping it. I do want to do my best to, to ask questions about how does it feel to approach this image? How does the atmosphere affect that? Um, and things like that, especially in the context of images that are still enshrined in temples, even if not in their original temples, because there are things like uh, the dim lighting, candlelight, um, the, the smell of incense, these sorts of things can inform the way that I can understand that experience. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Let's hope that we can all go across the seas as soon as possible to see the things we need to see and do the work we have to do. Okay. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, the next question is actually for myself to Tina. And I'm going to take the opportunity to ask you more questions about um, the culture of books entailed in your research with terrific and also a field I'm personally interested in. So Bao Qingbo himself was a famous book collector who lived in Hangzhou during the early Qing dynasty. So what was his motivations to copy this book by Li E? If the book was so mediocre in terms of quality, what was Bao Qingbo's motivation, motivations to copy this book by hand? And the comments and collation notes made by him, like what do the, those things tell us about the Qing scholars 
viewpoints of Song Dynasty painting? Like, was there like a scholarly dispute over the Song Dynasty painting history, or there were other interpersonal stories going on between him and you? Thank you. Hey, thank you for the question. Uh, for the first one, yes, you mentioned that Bao Tingbo is a famous book collector. So um, the catalog of Southern Song academic, academic painting is not the only one book he copied. He copied so many books. And he has a version that called Zhi Bu Zu Zai version that uh, collected so many books. So um, I think for him, he also take uh, Li Yue's book as one of his collections. As for the Li Yue's uh, problematic information in his book, I, 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 I can tell that actually Bao Tingbo did not found the problematic things at first. He at first copied all the book's context and then he proofread this. And that is the time he find there are some problematic things. For the inscription I read uh, in this book, there is one interesting uh, situation that, uh, remember I mentioned the catalog of precious painting. This is a book that the later scholars all criticize this a fake book at all. But actually, Bo Tingbo also take this book as a very uh, supported evidence at first. He not only proofread the original text and Leo's citation and make some re revision, and he also uh, added some inscription to introduce this book. But then the interesting is that after he, uh, after he done all these things, he later found that actually the book is fabricated. And that is why he made a final inscription site. This is a book filled with fake works and I have printed this book and I have regretting it after all. So as we can see, the inscription here is not written at one time. It is written at first and maybe after wire and edit. So th this situation can answer your second question uh, that I find uh, despite their context in the book, the inscription in this book are also very interesting uh, primary sources to help us understand how the readers to understand the book and how he uh, um, command and uh, command of, of this book. So uh, yeah, so I hope I, uh, I have answered your question. Thank you. I have another question for you, Tina, from Kara. Yes. Kara says, Tina, your presentation was very engaging. How do you think your research will impact future scholarship on Southern Song academic painting? Thank you, Kara. Um, well, actually, um, my study is not focused on the Southern Song academic painting, so um, I cannot provide anything new to uh, this time of period painting. But in my study, I'm trying to show that uh, this book is problematic on um, introducing Southern Song academic painting. So uh, for those scholars who use this book as the reference, uh, it, it should be noticed that we, 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 will, we should be careful about the, the text there. And you know, when I was in undergraduate, I found that um, the, um, there, there are some citations and people mentioned this book in the textbook. Um, I think it's still fine that we, uh, we, we still use the book as a reference in the future study, but uh, there's a one more thing we can do is that to check the context carefully and it's better to compare the original text first to better uh, confirm this context is not problematic. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. And now I'm moving toward questions for Jasmine. And our very first question comes from Professor Preminga Jacob from the Department of Art History, um, in especially South Asian art from the University of Maryland. And the question is, 
So for Jasmine, what is your vision for the future of the archive? That's a really big question. Um, if I had my like my way and I can make any sort of future, I guess it would be something that uh, the first priority would be would be care and instead of uh, instead of like encyclopedic knowledge. So if something is not was made not with the intention of lasting forever then acknowledging that it doesn't have to last forever or if there is some reason for for something to not be collected that it just that it just not be and that's okay and uh care also in the sense that the the people who the communities who the object or the items belong to are able to have autonomy over over the objects and over how they're presented and displayed that would also be a big part of it thank you jasmine uh, i have a second question for you um, from michelle fickrig who is another one of our student presenters this weekend who asks, Jasmine, can you speak a bit about how Wormsley differentiates archive versus memory? If the archive is within her, is there an important distinction? I think that there is a distinction in that it's more about when she says that the archive is within her it's more about a lack of a lack of trust in anything but herself to be able to to get the information and the feelings out and the while memory is something that we each are, are bringing to an archive like when we encounter it our own memories and it's much harder to uh, to engage with someone else's memory, right? In any in any way, there's always the something that we lose in translation. But I think that for Wormsley, her by holding part of her work within herself, there's always the opportunity of sharing. But knowing that, but just taking precautions on how it's shared and who it's shared with. Thank you very much, Jasmine. And I think Rachel has a question that she loved to ask by herself. Here you go, Rachel. And I was trying to be so discreet typing it into the YouTube chat. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Jasmine, and I also wanted to thank all of you for your wonderful talks. It's really cool to be in a panel with you all. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, I was really curious if, um, if uh, Lanier and Weems have ever met or collaborated, because I was also thinking about their connection as, as people trying to create their own archive as, as you know, black women in this, world. Um, and so I just wanted to know if if they've ever had a chance to to communicate about their um, kind of aligned connection. Um, I'm not sure, but Linear filed that lawsuit in March of 2019. So then the world changed. So I don't know what will happen. I guess it's something we'll just have to stay tuned for. Thank you. Great. Okay, I have one more question for Jasmine from Mia Hafer, who asked Jasmine, could you speak to the tension between the desire to guard personal memory and reclaim exploitative images and the desire to form community around the shared experiences or histories they may spark? Oh, yeah, I think about that all the time. Um, I 
So there's no easy answer. And I think that our, um, because, well, speaking as, as a, a black person in the United States, because we're displaced, there is this desire to, to research and to know and to seek out information that is that can be very difficult to come by uh, uh, because it's harder to find guides or mentors and that does that makes it more that like having holding things in like sacred and be and keeping them esoteric like that hurts that hurts someone who is still part of the community and so there's this balance that I don't I don't know what it will I don't know how it can it can work but I do know that um that in building spaces that are for specific communities like museums and galleries that are operated by black people for black people and that we're i think that that's a, a good path to go down to to try to work through some of those problems and balance that and balance that tension Thank you so much. And thank you all of you in general for your very thoughtful responses to these questions. Uh, we have time for one more question tonight, uh, which comes from our keynote speaker, Dr. Arabindan Kesson for all of the panelists, who says, I was impressed by all the papers. Thank you for your deep attention to the artworks and their implications for us now. I thought there was an interesting thread connecting these papers, which is that of mobility. We saw papers that examined the mobility of iconography, for example, in Rachel and Ashley's talk. In Tina's and Jasmine's paper, we had the opportunity to reflect on the implications of the fluidity and fixity of archival texts and archives, which have material implications for not only how we do art history, but how art history has a direct impact on the ways we relate to each other. My question is, how do you all think about how movement, fluidity, or its opposite in your work? Is it a concept that is important to you? Does it help us think differently about how we can do art history in the context of this symposium's themes? I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just coming from my own personal research, I think it's very interesting how we constantly have to think differently about fascism, for instance, depending on what moment in time um, we're looking at it. So looking at these fascist works would have been very different in 1945 or 1950 as they were in the 1980s and 90s as neo-fascism was starting to rise up and much differently today as we're dealing with like the implications of what it means to have neo-fascist groups rise up you know and trying to um grapple with that and deal with that in our global society so um i think not only is there movement in the iconography, but there's movement in the way we need to approach these works and how um, we need to understand them for both, you know, us looking at the past and looking at our present um, situation and how we want to move forward with that in the future. Yeah, and no, I, I definitely agree with that like future looking and thinking of how we can adapt. And, and I think that uh, being able to be fluid as an art historian and to like recognize that our objects of study are also, are also going to be fluid is important in keeping, in like keeping up with our our objects and keeping them and keeping our interpretations and our engagement with them viable. Um, 
Yeah, I um, thank you for that question. And I, I uh, what Jasmine also just said about um, you know recognizing the fluidity of the object over time also really resonated with me because um, in in general with worship images and also with my specific project um, the meaning and the ritual presence of an image can change in so many ways over so many centuries. And so especially when there are images um, that date back so many centuries as, as the ones that I'm studying, um, my, like my dissertation project begins with 10th century images actually. And then I move eventually into the 12th century. And so even just within generations of the same family worshiping these images, um, new images are made to be put next to them so that a different worship ceremony can be held. Um, and, and so there are all sorts of different changes in, in just the, the purpose of an image. And those are both uh, projected onto the image. And I feel as though the image with its own presence kind of projects the, you know, the, the, presence of, of the divine onto those new audiences in new ways as well. And so um, there's, uh, I want to avoid the, you know, looking at only the context in which it was made and tre treating that as the only thing that matters and also look at the various con con um, contexts in which um, people have worshiped images. And um, yeah, so I, that's a really exciting question to consider. <laughs> Thank you for uh, conclude such a uh, conclusion and thank you for the question. Uh, I also find that uh, in my study, um, my, my study for this book is not something new. Some, some previous scholars have studied it and many previous people have cited it. Um, one interesting I found during my study is that um, although we have studied such kind of book for a long time, but we can still we, we can still find a new perspective about this book. Uh, for example, when I studied it, I found that this book is not just a data collection. It also reflects the author's um, argument, although he didn't mention his argument directly. So yes, thank you for the question that reminded me that uh, for the uh, object or any paintings we study, we can always find some new perspective and to study them. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a wonderful way to end our conversation. So this brings us to the end of today's session of the 2021 KU Art History Graduate Student Symposium, Hindsight Is. I would like to express our gratitude to all of the panelists for their thought provoking presentations and insightful responses during this question and answer period. Thank you as well to our audience members for joining us this evening and for your questions to our group of presenters. We hope you will join us here again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central Time for the third and final day of the symposium, which will center on the theme of new contexts and new meanings. On the screen now is the schedule for tomorrow's presentations, which you can also find the link to in the description box below. Good night. <laughs>